Sebastian, if you'd like to share to some of your own personal journey as you worked with Jung's art and uh, imagery and all these wonderful, profound traditions. Yes, it's a, it's a long journey because it began like, well, I don't remember when I discovered Jung for the first time. I remember it was reading Ion, which was very um, impressive for me. Uh, because it was very interesting his interpretation of Pisces symbolism and Christ symbolism. And well, Jung uh, came oh, came anew uh, during my scientific research, during my research on Swedish, Swedish female artist, uh, Leonard Carrington, um, and his esoteric uh, interpretation uh, of, um, of myth. And the interpretation of esotericism by Carrington was a Jungian. Uh, interpretation. So it allowed me to to study Jung in a more scientific way, if I can say, and discover that he has uh, created also painting and uh, and sculptures, for example. And well, his paintings, his art was so fascinating, and also his his discourse uh, around them. That and so so. Um, well, so much thing uh, um, where where to say, where to study that. I, was, I have no other choice to begin to study this during my dissertation. I was the obviously we are discussed with my supervisors. We were, we were very excited by by this this materials, and yes, during four years it was a very intense works. I was also very. Um, I am grateful and for the, the support of the Christian Man Foundation uh, and also by the, the family, the young family for their support, for the, um, the access of the archives, their help for the postcard, for example. This is, this is um, um, I can say, not um, a solitary journey, but well, um, a journey with many friends, yes. In my experience, um, mostly, of course, here in New York with academics and uh, with the art world. Um, whenever I've gone to galleries or engaged with people uh, in conversation, what has shocked me, or maybe no longer am I shocked, I should say, is how few people after these numbers of years um, are familiar still with Jung's Red Book. I will go to a gallery show of early modern artists, many of whom you've mentioned. Um, I'll engage maybe the gallery director and I'll mention Jung, how similar his um, journey was with some of the artists and they just shrug their shoulders. I have a feeling this tends to be more of an American problem, if you will, uh, maybe less than in Europe, where I think Jung doesn't carry the same baggage he often carries in the American world. Um, could you care to address some of your observations in that regard? From my studies, it was very interesting because the most exhibition who, which were organized around Jung uh, visual works were precisely the United States in New York, in Washington, in Santa Barbara, for example. And um, I, I don't know, I think in France too, but in France for very specific reason, Jung is not read very much and well, these visual works are, are, are unknown. But um, I, I remember um, a conversation that I have with Massimiliano Gioni, who is the who was the curator of the Venice Venice Biennale in 2013, and who exposed the the Red Book at the entrance of the exhibition, and it was very interesting because he lived in the United States. Uh, it was a, a European manifestation, and. He decided to put uh, the light on the Red Book in the, this international uh, contemporary art exhibition. And I think it was a very important um, moment. And it was a before and after, because after we can see that uh, 
articles, books were published, were, were, were written. And for example, I was in London um, for, during the, the May, uh, and I visited in the Tate Modern the exhibition um, dedicated to Piet Mondrian and Ilma Klimt, where two abstract artists linked to spirituality. And in one of the room, uh, there were uh, reproductions of Jung's red book, oh. Jung images. And I was very excited because it is the, the well, from what I know, the, the first moment when in an um, exhibition dedicated to very strong and famous artists, Jung is also included. So I believe that also with my works and uh, works of other people who are working, um, for example, in London, um, Jung, uh, um, Jung's visual works were more and more famous and understand, and this is very important, but it's also so, it's, it's, um, what I would say is that uh, it is uh, possible because there are people who are making research and there are people who are helping them like the Christmas Foundation so well. The art world is interested in academic um, exercises and that is what prompted here. Nothing to do with anything spiritual in my opinion. So that was what uh, Lil White had to say. If you wanna chime in a little bit more. Of course, that's my opinion, but that is what I have found here. So I, Sorry, I, I'm opinionated there. I just had to put that out there. The United States, you mean? I suppose so, because I have no contact with what's happening in Europe or Mexico or anywhere else. And so here in New York, I have no contact with other cities in the United States. Hmm. I don't know, because, for example, I... Well, to complexify your, your session, uh, for example, like I mentioned in 19, uh, 1980s, uh, the exhibition in Los Angeles, the spiritual art, but precisely the first exhibition, we linked um, modern artists of abstraction to spirituality. So I'm not sure that it, it, um, there's nothing to do with anything spiritual. If if a spiritual, I think, if a spiritual aspect can help um, to understand uh, artistic practice, the spiritual can be can be considered like any other topic or any other, other yes, any other you know, topic. I, that I agree with I agree with you, but what I'm saying is, there's very very little, if any, evidence of that currently or in recent um history um i think that you the that maybe you can see a thread of that in yayo kusama but she is making handbags in paris so there's perhaps that is the big interest in her work mm. Well, I don't, I'm not, I'm a 20th century art historian, not a contemporary art historian, so I, I cannot say anything about Kusama's works. Mm, I don't know. I think it's a very complex question, but to understand, to, um, to have, a, we have, we have to have a great overview to the thing, so it would be necessary to, to study all the, the recent exhibitions that are organized or were organized, but Thinking about recent exhibition, I, I remember the exhibition dedicated to Emma F. Clint in New York at Guggenheim like two, two or three years ago. And clearly, um, this, the, her spiritual practice uh, cannot be um, put aside uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to understand his artistic practice. So, and I'm, for example, here in my university, there quite a lot of people who are making a PhD on artists interested in spirituality. So I think um, museums or cultural institutions and also art history research are, are interested in, in uh, the link between art and spirituality. Well, after 
I don't know if contemporary artists are more or less interested uh, in Spotify than before. It, for this, I have no, no answer. Somebody came into the library and was talking about drugs and the element of drug use in producing these images. I was curious if you could comment on whether or not Carl Jung uh, had any non nori states of consciousness that were drug induced while creating some of this art. Uh, you, you mean, um, you want to know if uh, Jung has taken drugs, for example? While doing some of this art, like did he explore non nori states of consciousness using some kind of psychedelic or some kind of Somebody told me that th that was a possibility. No, uh, well, I, I mean, he didn't admit that because I remember in a letter from the 1950s, um, when in his correspondence we were published, uh, when I don't remember who, but uh, people asked him about his opinion about a uh, psychedelic experience. And it was very opposite to him. Not only uh, is uh, supposed artistic practice with drugs, but more generally with the, the all the experience with drugs, because he was considering that he was um, yes, it can be pleasant because you you can have uh, beautiful images and uh, uh, shining colors, but it was not for him uh, a true experience with the unconscious. So I don't think he uses uh, this kind of drugs in um, in his creative process. No. Jung always insisted that his visual productions are not art, perhaps because it would um, then not be science. That is to say, research into the structure of the psyche. Your presentation of his work as art um, and the continuities between his spiritual interest and those of the modern artists are intriguing. Do you see similarities and differences between Jung's? Um, uh, I missed the last part right here. Um, uh, visual images and those of say Klimt. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, Klimt, I suppose uh, Deborah um, wants to, to talk about Ilmaf Klimt and not Gustav Klimt, the Austrian artist. Right, so, no, so, no, the, yeah, the... The, not, the, the not Gustav Klimt, the other one. Yes, the Swedish artist, yes. Yeah, that's it's a very interesting question, and uh, Bettina Kaufman uh, has written an article with another 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 um, art historian. I've uh, forgiven the name in the um, in the Aras paper uh, in two thousand and nineteen, uh, maybe on the um, supposed link between Ilma Klimt and and um, and Carl Gustav Jung, yeah. because there are clearly strongly similarities uh, in the. Um, in the, um, the iconographic references on the, the style. But um, the article was, was very interesting because there are not clear relations between the two, but more like um, a general cultural uh, context that can explain that, that both an other artist like uh, Mondrian, this is the subject of the exhibition in, in London, both these artists are interested uh, in the spiritual um, uh, discovery studies, and so all of this, uh, at the moment, take a choice to put apart um, a, a figurative mode or a, an exclusively figurative mode to undertake like a journey with um, a, a more abstract practice, which mm -hmm. is not abstract a, a pure abstract painting because but it's more progressively um more progressive process as we can see of course in young practice so um, yes link can be but uh, and, and um not direct link can be can be can be made between Jung and African production no that wasn't mm -hmm. what i meant to ask but more um that it seems to me that there's a um, there are both similarities and differences in the in their approaches because Jung always insists that his he's doing his art in the service of the science of of understanding the psyche, you know, um, whereas uh, Klimt is is having spiritual experiences with the group of painters that she's working with and then painting what she is directed to paint. Uh, and, and Mondrian, I don't know as well uh, his his connection, but 
I, I'm, I just, was just wondering if you had thoughts about sort of the, uh, maybe, uh, maybe the motives, but also the, um, the emphasis, uh, you know, where the emphasis lies, because, you know, Jung always seems a little defensive, like, no, it's not art, right? And then may, meantime, he's spending all this time buying special pigments and, you know, taking hours painting his paintings and what is it if it isn't art but so that that was more the what i meant by the question yeah he has a very ambiguous discourse of his practice because officially he didn't he say it wasn't art but also uh, i remember a letter to the writer Hermann hesse when uh, he sent uh, a copy of the septum sermones at motros with the system mundi totius was included in it so well, officially, at least, he was not considering himself as an artist, but yes, it's very ambiguous. But in its practice, in a certain way, and this is part of, well, a, a part of my dissertation, yes, we can see, we can, in a certain aspect, it's a very complex question, but considering Jung as a kind of visionary artist, of uh, Ilma F. Klimt too, because when he said that in when this image emerged from the conscious, uh, he not he didn't he didn't control him. Uh, this is the same definition that we can that um, Ilma F. Klimt, for example, can can make of his visionary experience. Only only the only the source is different mm. officially. So this is, yes, a question that is now is, is um, already open to, well, to, to answer. <laughs> All right. Uh, really enjoyed this uh, presentation. Um, I'm wondering what uh, Carl would have thought about, uh, I guess it really took off after his death, the art therapy, formal art therapy movement where every manner of artistic, graphic, you know, musical, whatever, uh, but often graphic expression from uh, individuals, you know, that's considered art, a therapeutic use of art. And it's, it just seems so um, odd given, uh, um, given uh, Gustav's, you know, Carl's use of, uh, you know, love of artistic expression, sculptures, paintings, statues, you name it. And then he goes about creating some of this stuff on his own, but he doesn't consider it art. I'm wondering if that's a little self critique of himself saying, oh, this is just dabbling. I'm no artist, who am I kidding? Um, as opposed to saying, gosh, look at what some of these other people are doing, including cultures 2000 years ago or more and they're expressing themselves graphically or you know, three-dimensionally, and um, I consider it art. So it just seems odd, but again, making that connection because you know, he did see, uh, he was a clinician among other things, and what he, I, I imagine he would be pretty uh, enthused about artistic expression in therapy and treatment, i.e. art therapy. Yes. Uh, Any comments from, yes, yeah, Sebastian? Any comments? Thank you. Well, I'm not um, a psychologist. I'm only an art historian. So I can, I'm not, I think I'm not legitimate to have, well, but um, maybe the term art therapy, the art therapy only as a definition of a therapy with um, a practice which is not psychic. Uh, it can be also the, the, uh, another name can be correct, like a visual uh, or a plastic therapy. You know, um, I think when Jung was um, having this this practice, or when he was um, um, what is the term? He was um, oh, sorry for my English. Uh, he was when um, he talked about uh, his passion to to draw, to to paint, etc. It was not clearly with a, an artistic purpose. It was only, in fact, a, a therapy. But the fact that this this work is um, are considered artistic or not was not was not the matter. 
And as, um, as, I, as I understand, in the Carl Gustav Institute in Zurich, uh, this material uh, preserved by the, um, from the young patients are considered medical, um, medical um, document. And so they are very, very difficult to, to consult, to reproduce, etc. So they are not at the first uh, at the first side an artistic status. And I can say that their artistic status um, came after and came after by the, the exhibition uh, in which they are presented. So they're like we can see a posthumous um a posthumous artistic um stages after uh the the creation of the the painting of the sculptures and it's the same by Jung because Jung has a, I would say a very ambiguous um uh, definition of the nature of this drawing and the sculptures and paintings but the fact, the fact is, after, um, especially after 2009, a very large exhibition where the red book or the painting uh, were the subject. So we can, we can consider that, that the, the, the artistification of Jung's visual work is, in, is still in process, is um, like a, a living process, you know? It is my, well, what, what I can say. Merci beaucoup. Je vous en prie. Thank you. And also, <laughs> also, I wanted to mention that Jung Christine Mann Library uh, has some books, uh, including A uh, Jungian Approach to Spontaneous Drawing, Window to the Soul, which is a more recent book written by, I believe, a Pacifica graduate. So that's interesting to look at the art therapies and the, and the various art of people who are um, um, under treatment, uh, including the upcoming book, uh, oops, uh, including the upcoming book um, that I, po I posted in the chat um, of patients of Jung's and their drawings, um, historical document. I posted in the chat uh, at the top. I can repost it if people are interested. Uh, and of course, I got Travers, Treasures from the Archives, Sijung Institute, Institute Zurich, um, image created by patients in analysis, 1917, 1955. So um, it, that's included, it's going to be included in our collection as soon as it's published. So um, yeah, we have a good collection of art therapies and, and various kinds of therapies in the Christine Mann Library. Yeah, VJ, uh, this is Dr. Graham once again. Uh, I really appreciate this uh, whole discussion and presentation. It's wonderful. And uh, yeah, I mean, I have, uh, speaking of archives, I have quite a bit of artistic what I uh, artistic production from patients as it were in in my treatment files and records of patients I've had over the years and with a number of them I've uh, at in the course of the treatment uh, it it comes to the front and saying uh, have you considered this an artistic expression an expression coming from within you in in, in an artistic manner and for many of them, it's sort of an eye opener. But the point is, and I'm thinking even historically, there's any number of even professional artists uh, that in the course of their treatment, they don't go public with this often, you know, <laughs> at the gallery, uh, but they have produced things and they say, gosh, these were some seminal works in my artistic development. And it was in the midst of being treated for any number of kinds of psychological disorders or ongoing. So it's certainly, a, it's a gray area, you know, what's artistic expression of a person's in treatment as opposed to they're not, or a diagnosable condition, but they're not, but they're expressing art, music, dance, theater, poetry, and of course, graphic arts, you know, pre, you know, representational. I'm sort of thinking about the, your um, use of the idea of cultural transfer and the way that the avant-garde artists don't so much transfer formal visual motifs as they transfer ways of seeing and ways of acting in a way. Um, and I'm, try I'm trying to formulate for myself what Jung's mode of cultural transfer is. And I think um, it's something, it isn't the same as the avant-garde artists in that he's 
for example, in the um, in the image that you showed of the serpent with, and then the border around the edge with the um, stylized motifs, it seems as though there he's actually he is transferring formal motifs, r not ways of acting artistically, but he's transferring them with an eye or with, with an interest in what those formal motifs do for him spiritually. And that's a difference between what the avant-garde artists are doing and what he's doing. And, and I'm having a hard time articulating those differences, but th that interests me because I, I do think there's a his way of using his um, artistic practice is different from the way the avant-garde artists are using theirs and the balance of or, or um, the the role of of the spiritual is different. Um, so anyway, I don't know if you have any comments on that, but that's that's an observation, I guess. No, it's a very interesting comments because clearly the the insertion of Jung in this cultural transfer uh, is, for example, very different from Emil Nolde uh, paintings mm -hmm. where he just take. Uh, uh, a figuration and he put in his painting yes uh -huh. and Jung for example most particularly in the in the, the painting you mentioned um, yes put not clearly a figure but more a style in his right. painting exactly but uh, in addition also the significance well he, he understood of this painting, of this um, of this uh, production in New Mexico, in his uh, in his own painting, so this is, to me, clearly um, a kind of uh, an example of cultural transfer, but also the example of a, of the complexity of this notion, because clearly cultural transfer. Uh, I differentiate, for, for example, I differentiate uh, very strongly appropriation from cultural transfer. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cultural transfer is not only, in fact, the, uh, take an image and uh, put it in, in under the context, is also, like Michel Espagne say, said, a resemantization. And I think this is, yes, effective in Jung's, like in other artists of the avant-garde, because also in the... Um, Avant-garde, we, we didn't only have this, um, this uh, figurative copying. We also have like the personal interpretation like we have, we have seen from Cubist sculptures. So, well, this is another example we can say of the ambiguity of the place of Jung in modernity, simply because in a way, in a certain way, is part of the modernity of the avant-garde, well, in its very um, most uh, general definition. And in another way, he has a very original practice, which cannot be so clearly be, be linked to avant-garde, etc. And for another way, he, he is resistant to the avant-garde, but also this can be considered to be modern. So this is because one of the topic of my of my dissertation is to talk about modernities and not in you know, only modernity, but clearly yes, very very interesting uh, observation. Yes. So it's been a while since I struggled through reading the Red Book, and uh, it's difficult to remember all the passages. If I'm remembering correctly, though, and somebody can maybe help me, in the Red Book there is a situation where a very seductive woman tries to tell Jung that he's an artist and that he should focus on his art and he should get famous as an artist. And he has to resist that temptation because he's seeing art as the road toward another purpose rather than an end in itself. And I think the artists see themselves uh, as, as artists with a capital A, that's their primary purpose. And Jung is saying, we create art to go deeper into the self and to get uh, more of a sense of of what's going on in the unconscious, in in the psyche, so that we can expand and, and deepen our sense of who we are and what we are. I also think it's important to mention that the whole idea of the expressive arts, and in my opinion, although I'll um, offend some people by saying that, I am a Jungian analyst, 
and I'm not an art therapist, but I believe that the expressive arts will be the uh, an avenue that uh, therapy and analysis is going to be taking more and more in the years ahead. And the expressive arts as therapies were developed by Jung's patients. The earliest one that I know of was a woman named Margaret Naumburg, uh, who was a patient of, of Jung, as were other members of her, her family. And after finding uh, the Walden School in Art, uh, sorry, the Walden School in New York City, uh, she went on really to become uh, an art therapist. And other Jungians have used uh, all the different modes of the expressive arts, whether you're talking about body movement, uh, whether you're talking about making music or sculpting or, or painting. Uh, they recognize that those are ways of deepening your psychological process and, and bringing a new dimension into your therapy. So I just wanted to uh, mention that. Thank you. Yeah, Beth, I uh, really appreciate those comments. Yeah, it's, I see, you know, artistic expression is an externalization uh, of psychological processes combined with other things, you know. So yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's, it's, it's a good avenue as, as, as Jung pointed out to the unconscious and expressing that allowing that to be manifest in all kinds of ways, right? You know, there's, you know, any of the artistic media, you know, pretty vast, but yeah, it's, uh, it's very, it's very helpful. Yeah. I'd like to bring in T.S. Eliot here. And if I'm remembering correctly, and sometimes I don't, I make things up. Um, I believe Eliot uh, used the phrase uh, of the objective correlative uh, and when he was writing The Wasteland, he was going nuts. His wife had gone crazy and he was an American and he wanted to be a poet and he'd come to England and he was working in a bank and everything was falling apart. And so all this crazy stuff, despair was swirling around in his head and he started writing it down and um, he couldn't really give it shape and form. Um, his friend Ed Ezra Pound had to do that. And what Ezra condensed and edited became The Wasteland. And Eliot dedicated that to him as the better craftsman, Emilio Fabro. But, but the important thing there is that uh, I think that Eliot couldn't do that himself. He knew he had to get it out. But without the help of someone else, uh, it just, it would have drowned him. Yeah. So I think that's important too. What I particularly found interesting in the Red Book itself, Sebastian, was that the way the text is written and the way the images are framed sometimes with that kind of embroidered edge, all of those elements are virtually inseparable. And I have never seen any other book, maybe maybe something like um, like in Siena one time I saw these choral music books that were humongously huge, you know, for the choir to sing out of. Maybe something like that was akin to it, but other than like that kind of form, I have never seen anywhere. And I think that's kind of, you know, really separates it out because the pictures and the words are inseparable somewhat. As in a European fashion, I mean, Asian art has, you know, landscape paintings with calligraphy, poems on them, there's that, but, but they're not, they're poems, they're not like a vast story. Yes, this, um in several character between the text and image is clearly uh, very important. Uh, obviously in the Liber Primus, the first part of the, of the, of the Red Book. But for example, we can, note, we can notice that um, more and more we progress in the book, in the Red Book, I mean, not um, in the Black Book, in the Red Book, and particularly in the, in the, in the Liber Segundus, the um, images Jung painted are less linked to the text. And for example, we have all the series of the mandala, 
which were which were uh, based on the series of sketches that he made in Chateau Deux, uh, which are I don't know like twenty mandalas, are clear um, are clearly interrupting the the red book the text. Uh, we have also other paintings, for example, the mandala, the, the mandala of the of the, the Golden Castle, the mandala of Liverpool, uh, which are not directly linked to the text. So it seems that the red book, um, contrary to the, to the black books, for example, is like, um, you know, he made it in like 20 years. So like a, a, um, um, a living object. So uh, who, who lived with Jung. So maybe he has like maybe I, a certain idea when in beginning the book, for example, a clear reference to medieval uh, codices. And after uh, maybe with his travel to in the in a foreign land, um, clearly the, the, the goal became different, it appears, in my opinion. And uh, yes, we have all these uh, last images that were not, that can be independent, that became independent of the text. Well, Sebastian, I can't thank you enough for sharing such rich and original research. Of course, we wish you good luck toward completion of your dissertation. You. What are your plans? What is your expected? I know that's used somewhat loosely in academia, but what is your goal to be completing? Thank you. Thank you very much. And when, but when do you plan to be completed with the dissertation? I hope uh, in December 2024. So one, in, uh, one year and a half. Good luck. Um, I will stay in touch. But before we all say goodbye, I want to show that this is the certificate. Wow that you will be receiving in the mail uh, sometime in the near future. Um, it's something we're very proud of to, of course, honor your great and original research. Thank you. Uh, what a contribution to the field. We do plan to keep you, you know, on call to share with us with future research. So thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you very much. And before we all say goodbye to each other, um, I just want to invite everyone to learn more about the award and what else is going on at the Christine Mann Library by visiting our website at www.junglibrary.org.